Father, and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. How easy it is sometimes to underestimate the simple things in life. How it is that simple things, simple actions, when done regularly and repeatedly in life, really can have a powerful impact over the long haul. I remember a long time ago watching a segment on Ripley's Believe It or Not about a man named Craig Dawson. He had this really unusual habit. Every morning when he would go jogging, and he did it every morning religiously, as he'd run down the sidewalks and the streets of his city where he lived, his eyes would not be looking around him, but rather would be looking straight down at his feet, scanning the ground immediately in front of him, never looking up. And it wasn't because he was scared of you know, some unforeseen obstacle or tripping over a crack in the sidewalk or something. It wasn't because he was shy and didn't want to look people in the eyes as he ran by them. No, rather he was looking for something specific. He was looking for spare change. A penny here, a nickel there, maybe every once in a while a quarter. But here's the thing. Over the course of 25 years of jogging every morning, scanning the ground wherever he went, collecting those pennies and dimes and nickels, over the long haul of 25 years, he wound up collecting a whopping $8,500 in spare change. Right? Proof of the power of how simple things, simple actions, simple habits, when done regularly and repeatedly, really can add up to something big, really can have an incredible impact. Well, you know, in a lot of ways, I think... The ministry of the church, the work and mission of the church is much the same. Our mission, our ministry, is so much more about the day-to-day -day and the week-to-week. -week. Being in God's Word as a people of God, more than it is about some big event or some big mission initiative. No, it's the regular daily life of living in God's Word of meeting weekly, to gather around his word. It's through simple things like bread and wine and water and baptism. In these simple, small things, God communicates and gives his life-changing word that shapes us and encourages us and most importantly, forgives us. And yet it's strange how sometimes our sinful flesh, our sinful nature, so often wants to dismiss such simple things. The regular receiving of God's word through all these simple means, our flesh sometimes says, ah, you know, all I need is the big occasional. The big occasional dose of God's word, right? As long as I get it occasionally and in a big enough quantity, then I'm good to go. I think sometimes we treat our spiritual health a lot like we sometimes treat our physical health in that way. And when it comes to staying healthy physically, most and all medical experts and, and fitness gurus agree that the best way to prevent life-threatening diseases and, and to prevent premature aging, to stay healthy and fit, is to eat a good diet, right? Lots of fruits and vegetables, healthy fats, to get some regular exercise every day. If you do these things daily and regularly and repeatedly over the long haul, it has a powerful effect. But you know, I think a lot of Americans, obviously, don't buy into that, right? When it comes to physical health, we a lot of times just want to wait till we have a problem, a sickness, or we need the surgery, and then we'll go to the doctor and get the big medication or have the doctor do the surgery. We don't always, and we're not always so good at employing the little things, the things that are good and add up over time. We have a hard time seeing how a little broccoli on our plate every day or jogging around the block can make a difference. <laughs> how much more so in our spiritual life sometimes when we, we treat the Word of God and how we treat it. You know, today is rally day here at St. Paul, and much like two weeks ago when we had Christian Education Sunday and celebrated and gave thanks for the, the ministry of our school, today we get to give thanks and celebrate the opportunities God has given us as a congregation to bring God's Word to bear on the lives specifically of our children through Sunday school and confirmation ministries, but on us all through, through Bible study and all the other regular ways that our church communicates God's Word in our community. 
And indeed, today, like we're always encouraged to do by God's word, we are about making sure that the next generation receives the faith, is taught the faith, and receives it in a way that they can go out in the world and have a powerful impact. Our text from Deuteronomy 4 emphasizes that today very much. In the way that God's people kept his commands and lived in his word, all the rest of the world would see and know that Yahweh was good. You're probably familiar with a couple chapters later when God again speaks to his people about the importance of one generation passing the faith on to the next. He says in Deuteronomy 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. And then he goes on to say, These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Notice the strong words there, the strong language. They impress, impress it on your children. In English, that almost brings up the idea of almost branding your children with it, right? Like, like a rancher would brand the cattle with his mark. So we are to make sure that our children are marked with the word of God, that it marks their life and their conduct and their choices and their beliefs. The actual Hebrew word here is shanan, which literally verbally implies the, the scraping of a knife along a whetstone to sharpen it. The sharpening of a knife, which in and of itself is just a simple act, right? Swiping a knife one time across a whetstone doesn't really do anything. It doesn't really sharpen the knife. It doesn't amount to anything. But, but if you do it 50 times, well now all of a sudden the knife grows sharp. It becomes an effective tool. A dull knife is no use at all, right? Chefs will tell you that a dull knife is more dangerous than a, a sharp knife. And so it is that a good chef, if he wants a good knife, has to regularly and repeatedly drag that knife across the whetstone. So it is in the way that we are to raise our children in the faith, God's word says, regularly and repeatedly in the everyday kinds of things when you rise up in the morning or go down in the evenings. Children must regularly be told the simple things of the faith too. It doesn't have to be complicated. They simply need to know who Jesus Christ is know why he matters for their lives. And then they need to be told that over and over and over again. If children are to grow up to be Christians, they have to know what it means to be a Christian. They must be sharpened regularly in this way. So how well do we do that? You know, honestly, it's that question that really, the last few years in ministry, just as I, the longer I am a pastor and see our world and see the church in general, not just here, but, but abroad. It's a question like that that really scares me for the future of the church. And it's not because of the, the world out there and the culture that we live in that's grown increasingly sick. You know, and just the way that, that so much of what God's word says and Christian morals and values and ethics are being thrown out the window. Yeah, it's, it's getting bad out there in that way, but, but that's nothing new for the church. I mean, the church has almost always through history existed in such contexts. Our, that's what Deuteronomy was written for, for God's people, because they were about to enter such a context. They were going into the promised land, Canaan, that was filled with all kinds of peoples who did not honor God's way, who lived in ways that were wicked. And God is preparing them to live as his people in that context. Now, it's not so much the world out there that's frightening for the future of the church, but rather it's the question, what are we doing to prepare our children as God's people? What are we doing? How well are we doing at passing along the faith? How are we impressing it upon them? Because God gets really specific in Deuteronomy. Do it daily. In the morning, in the evening, when you're walking on the road, write it on the walls of your home and on the doors. And most importantly, upon your heart. But you know, if studies are to believe, be believed, we as Christians aren't doing such a good job of that. Not just maybe at the level of the church. The church is one level, but it starts in the home. In fact, that in Scripture too, it begins with the home. That's where the faith is primarily to be taught. And 
Many, many studies say today that maybe only about 5% of Christian homes regularly, repeatedly, daily impart the faith, talk about the faith, discuss the faith in small ways with their children, parents doing this with kids. So maybe you're part of that 5%, but I'd wager there's a whole lot of us even here today that are part of the 95% that are still trying to find a way to get that done, to get that habit accomplished in, in their family's life. And it's not just a problem today, I've come to find out. You know, I used to think that that's just a modern problem, but when I talk to old-timers, they seem to say that the same was true when they were little. When I ask them, well, what, well, how did they talk about the faith in their home? Most of the time, I'll get this. Well, my mom or dad never really did talk about their faith. We never did do any of that kind of stuff at home. But at least my mom and dad always made sure we were in church every Sunday. Going to church was not an option. We were there, and we were in Sunday school. So at least 50, 60, 70 years ago, we had that going for ourselves as a church. Families may not have been talking much about the faith at home, unfortunately, but at least they were in church and in Sunday school and in Bible study. But today, we know that families increasingly are not in church and Sunday school and Bible study. If statistics are to be believed. And even here at St. Paul, I mean, we have lots of kids in our congregation, but even on a good Sunday, we have maybe 20% of them in Sunday school. Our Bible study has maybe 10% of our worshiping population. How are we doing at imparting the faith on the next generation? I'm quite certain that at least the current statistics are not what the Lord intended. Not what he wanted for his people then in the days of Moses, nor for his children today. And you know, as parents, we, and I say we because I'm a parent too, we have to take this seriously. This isn't an option. God specifically speaks to us every time he refers to children in the scriptures. He speaks also to the responsibility of parents in raising up their children in the faith. And it happens by not just the way that we practice our faith. Just bringing our kids to church and Sunday school is great and that's good, but there also needs to be deliberate instruction, deliberate teaching that takes place. And you know, if we're going to start at the beginning where the responsibility begins, it's with not just parents, but with dads specifically, fathers. You're the head of your household. You're the head of the faith at the home. It starts with your example. Having a heart for your children's eternal destiny is not a womanly, sissy, sentimental thing. Talking about the faith with your kids is the most manly thing you can do. Being a man of God means your faith is evident, not just when you happen to be at church, but wherever you are. Whether that's in the shop, or as you're driving to ball practice, or in the cattle pen, or on the tractor, or in the deer stand, wherever you are, your faith goes with you, and your faith should be seen and expressed in a way that your children can learn from you. Teaching the faith isn't just the wife's job. And, by the way, it's not my job as the pastor. It's your job, first and foremost, as fathers and as parents. It's your job to teach your children the Apostles' Creed. It's your job to teach them the Lord's Prayer. It is your job, God says in Deuteronomy, to teach them the Ten Commandments and what they mean for their lives. It's your job to make sure when they're in church, they fold their hands and they pay attention and they sing along and why? Because when they look at you, they see you doing the same things. And if dad does it, then I've got to do it. There's no other choice. Don't push it off. And don't expect me to work miracles later when they get to confirmation age. Start now. Encourage them now. Pray with them now. Make sure they understand the importance of being where God's word is and God's people are now in church and Sunday school. And you know, the funny thing is, doing any of these things, it's not hard. See, it's not like we, we have to be, you know, experts or have masters in theology to do this. To simply pray, to teach the Ten Commandments, to say the Apostles' Creed, to be in church. These are easy things, right? It's just like diet and exercise. Eating some vegetables and fruit is really easy. Anyone can do it. But why is it so hard for us to start these habits and stick with it? No, God wants us to live our faith intentionally. And that's the only way to start a new habit, is to do it intentionally every day. And you don't have to move mountains, right? Like I said, the key is to keep it simple. Doing simple things over the long haul adds up in a big way, makes a powerful impact. 
Simply doing something small and repeating it and repeating it and repeating it until it becomes a part of life. I remember several years ago, me and my wife, we, we've always tried to have different devotion times and find ways that it, to make it work with our changing schedules. But when our kids were young, we started going through the catechism, just the very first part of it, the first section of questions. It's amazing how the catechism is great for little kids. It's almost too simple for, for older kids once you get to that age. It's really set up for five, six, seven-year-olds. It's just question, answer, question, answer. And so we were going to go through all these questions with our kiddos at the time. Ellie and Ethan were only maybe five or six, not that old. And I think, kept thinking, oh, this will take three weeks and we'll be through this section. But it was crazy. We were like six weeks into it, doing it after supper at night when we could. And we had maybe made it through four questions. Because every night we'd get out the catechism, I think, all right, tonight we can finally move on to another question. And lo and behold, we'd review the old questions and somebody would have forgotten, right? And so we'd go back and reteach and reteach. And these questions weren't hard. The very first question in the catechism is, what does it mean to be a Christian? But you know, it's funny, the answers that my kids gave, they weren't bad answers, but they weren't right answers. They'd say things like, well, to be a Christian means to be nice, to go to church, to say my prayers. Ethan would say, not to punch Ellie, my sister, you know? That's what it means to be a Christian, right? Well, yeah, we want Christians to be nice and in church and saying their prayers, but that's not what it means to be a Christian. The answer was simple. The answer was to believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and only source of salvation. The answer was Jesus. Right? But the kiddos didn't know that. They were guessing all kinds of other stuff. The only way they could know it was to hear it from me and my wife and then to hear it regularly till it became a part of the way they thought of themselves as Christians. That's all it means to teach the faith. To take the simple things and simply impress them upon our children until it becomes a part of who they are. You know, that the family can't obviously do this alone then either. That's what the church exists for. All families coming together, all of us coming together and supporting each other in that work. Pastors and Sunday school teachers and all the other ways that the church offers ministry for families then to also encourage and increase their children's understanding of the faith. I mean, just... Think about how these habits then have an impact on us. I know so many of you sometimes when I talk to you and you were out of town on a weekend and weren't able to be in church, people always say, it just didn't feel like my week really got started because I didn't start with church. Well, that habit started when you were a child. And even now to this very day, you still feel incomplete when your week doesn't begin with church. It shows the power of a good habit when, when started early in life, the fruit it can bear and the way it can help us focus on what is most important later on and you know you can start at any time doing this I mean I know all of us are in different places in life we have little kids maybe your kids are teenagers maybe they're already grown and have kids of their own or, or you have grandkids or maybe you don't have any kids and it's nieces and nephews but we all in some way through the church especially have co a context wherein we can help impart the faith and impress it on the next generation do it in whatever way you can in the way you live your faith and set an example and in the opportunities you take to deliberately teach it. Because even if you haven't done much of it in the past, I promise you the Lord's not going to fail today and tomorrow and, and the next day to give you opportunities. In fact, it's amazing how God is so amazingly gracious that way. We can fail and fail and fail and fail and fail and all we have to do is turn around and look for the next opportunity because the Lord is going to get it. This is the work that He wants done and may He continue to strengthen us then so that we can do this work faithfully, like iron sharpening iron. Not just in our families, and not just here in Thorndale, but beyond. In Jesus' name, amen.